talking about managing your project dependencies with Composer. Uh, we just had a big, huge introduction about myself, so let's do it again. Um, like I said, we, I work at Scanware, just a local Provo startup. Uh, we were on Shark Tank back in, it was it October, and we did not get funded thanks to Mark Cuban, but we, uh, <laughs> we later raised a $7 million uh, fund, so, so we're not too worried. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I've been doing PHP for 13 years, 10 years professionally. I work with Symphony, um, love doing Ember JS on the front end. I know there's a lot of people that like Angular, but give Ember a try, it's fun. Uh, at Scan, we're trying to connect the physical and digital worlds together. We do it right now through a lot of QR codes. We won't always be doing QR codes. Uh, QR codes is the easiest way to do it right now, but who cares if QR codes got a date? That's not our business. Our business is connecting the uh, digital and physical worlds. Right now we have QR codes for business cards, following people on social networks, contacting people with email or phone. <coughs> um, we have two new products coming out. One lets you use QR codes to, to purchase things. So if you're in an airplane looking through the SkyMall magazine, you find something you want to buy, you scan it and complete the purchase right there and have it shipped to your house or whatever. Or Red, Fly or Red Cross gives you a flyer that says, hey, there's Typhoon in the Philippines, scan this to donate and they can collect donations uh, by putting out those flyers or whatnot. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, you can, that's my QR code that goes to my business card type thing. Um, I have links on there to my board game collection and to all the things I spend my money on on Kickstarter. Big into board games, so I spend all my money on Kickstarter. So if you want to see what I'm doing there, you can scan that and check it out. Um, if you need a scanner, you don't have to download ours, but if you want to, you can't see it, but it's at free.scan.me, and that'll take you to a scanner you can use to scan QR codes. Anyways, <coughs> we're talking about Composer uh, and the problems that we're trying to solve with Composer and managing our project dependencies. So let's say uh, it's your first day on the job, you're starting a new job, the senior developer comes up and helping you set up your environment, tells you to go, GitHub clone down the company website and then says, hey, you have to install all these other third-party libraries. You need to go get Guzzle and Monolog and the Zen framework. You need PHP unit. You need a, a Selenium web driver for PHP. All these company third-party libraries. Go get those downloaded and installed. So you spend your next hour downloading everything, figuring out where it needs to be in the directory structure making sure everything's hooked up, load up your website, and you get all these get all these errors saying, hey, methods are missing, or the arguments you pass in are wrong, they're not what they expect, nothing's working. You go bug the senior developer, he has to come <laughs> over, look to see how you set everything set up. And oh, you've, you've downloaded the newest version of, of the Zen framework, and they're on Zen framework version 2.4, they're out of date, whatever. And so you have to go uninstall everything you just downloaded, download the right versions, get that all set up again, and everything's working. Then you're on your unit tests, and oh, you've installed the wrong, the wrong version of PHP unit. Again, they're on a different version of PHP unit than the one you've installed, so you have to go set up PHP unit again. And it can be a little bit annoying. So you decide to make this easier for the next new developer that comes along. You go ahead and go into the uh, the repo that you cloned down, and you said, hey, I'll just, I'll just commit all of these libraries to the repo. That'll make it easy for the next developer to get going. So you, you download the zip file for Guzzle, you extract it into the, the, the company's website repo, you do a git add and commit it. <laughs> Good idea? Probably not. Your, your senior developer is probably not going to be too happy with you. He'll, he'll come by and say, what in the world did you just do? You just added tons of libraries to the repo. We don't maintain any of them. Um, now, when you try to update, you're going to have to go download all the files, replace them all into your repository, commit everything back up, and your history is going to be updated Guzzle, updated some libraries, and if you're not going to, you're going to lose the history of those libraries uh, if you were using their, their, their repos. And sometimes it's helpful to look through the history, see what's changed, what's happened, what files have changed, and now you have your own history. Also, when you start committing these libraries to your, to your repo, someone's 
going to go in there and, and start modifying these third core libraries, these th third party libraries. They find a bug, hey, it's, it's committed, it's right here in my source code, I can change it, commit it, everyone's going to have that bug fix. And now you've got a forked library, and next time you update, you're either going to forget that you've made all those changes and get all corrupted and messed up because you forgot all those changes, or you're going to have to go manually and make all those changes again, and it can be really annoying. So you definitely don't want to do this. So what's another solution? Well, Git has submodels. So hey, let's let's use submodels instead of instead of adding the entire uh, project to your repo. Let's just add a pointer to it using Git submodules. It's really easy to set up. Git submodule add, point to guzzle, commit the guzzle <laughs> library. New developer comes by, clones it down, and he has a whole bunch of third-party libraries folders like called Guzzle, but if you go inside of them, they're blank. There's nothing inside of them, so you're like, oh, you have to initialize your submodels and you have to update your submodules, and then you'll actually have the code. So there's a few extra steps when you're when you're cloning down a website, when when you're cloning down your repo, but no big deal. That's just a little bit of training. You can you can train someone how to do that, right? Now now it's time to to. New, new versions of these libraries come out, and you have to figure out how to update them in your submodules. So you Google around a bit, and you're like, okay, you have to go inside of each of your submodules, check out the master, pull it, go back to your root, add it, commit it again, and now your submodules are updated. You have 20 third party libraries, do it 20 times. That gets a little bit tedious, so you're like, oh, there's probably a solution for this. You Google around, find a neat command, you can do, oh, get submodel for each, get pull. That makes it easier, but still, there's a problem with using submodels. It's it's a good solution. It's not it's much better than committing everything directly into your repo, but there's still a problem with it. Anybody have an idea? What if you're not using? What if you want to use something that's not Git? There's third-party libraries out there that are in subversion, uh, that are in pair. What if you want to use one of those? Are you going to <laughs> clone their? clone their project and make a git mirror of it so you can use a git submodule. You're going to spend all your time maintaining that mirror every time they make a change, update your mirror and, and get that working. Not very fun. So there, there has to be a better way, right? Composer. Okay, so Composer solves a lot of these problems. It makes it easier to set up all your dependencies. Makes it easy to keep track of all the versions of those dependencies. Makes it easy to update the dependencies. You can use dependencies no matter whether they're Git, SVN, they're in pair, or whatever. So Composer's a, a tool for dependency management. This is, I'm, I'm reading this quote off of the uh, Composer website. It says, Composer is a tool for dependency management in PHP. It allows you to declare the dependent libraries your projects need and it will install them uh, for you. It's not a package manager. Uh, it deals with packages or libraries, but it manages, it manages them on a per project basis. It installs them into a directory, usually vendor, and by default it will never install anything globally. Thus it's a dependency manager. Okay? So this isn't a, this isn't a new idea. Um, if you've worked in other programming languages, Ruby has Bundler. Uh, Node has NPM, uh, but it's, it's kind of the first, first real similar thing in PHP. Um, you declare your dependencies, Composer installs them specifically for that project. It's not going to install them globally across your entire system like pair or something. It's going to put it specifically in that project folder. And if you have another project that needs different versions of those same libraries, you're fine because it's installing them into that folder as well. So you have different libraries in each, in each of your project's folders, and they can each have their own unique versions. So like I just said, you have a project that depends on a number of libraries. Some of those libraries depend on other libraries. You declare the things that you depend on, and Composer figures out what versions, what packages needs to be installed, and installs them, meaning it downloads them to your, into your projects. Uh, point number two, Composer also takes care of dependencies of your dependencies. So if you're using Monolog. Monolog has a dependency on the PSR log. It will go and figure that out for you and download that dependency for you. You don't have to know all the dependencies of your dependencies. 
they will figure that out for you and download everything that you need to use your dependencies. There's several different ways to install Composer. Um, and you can see these all on, on the getcomposer.org website. You don't need to quickly write these down. There's, you can install it locally just to a specific project folder. Uh, you just scroll down a file and run it through PHP, and then you have a flower that you can, that you can run to use Composer. If you want to install it globally, if you want to use it across all your different projects and anywhere on your system, you can uh, move that FAR file that you downloaded into your bin and use it that way. When you, when you do install it into your bin, your bin, you just have to type in Composer instead of phpcomposer.far, so that's a little bit nicer. And then there's, there's this third way that I just found out about. Uh, this is new. I haven't tried it out yet, so I'm not sure pros and cons on it, but if you've used Homebrew, uh, you can tap into um, Jose Gonzalez Homebrew PHP and install it that way, and that will install it globally across the entire system. Has anyone installed it through Homebrew? Just curious. I I, I don't I don't know how that works. I don't know if then you have to use Homebrew to keep it updated. Um, so instead of doing Composer self update, which you normally do to update if you now have to do Brew upgrade, I'm not sure. So if someone does find out. Have fun. I'll figure it out later. <laughs> Once you've got Composer installed and set up, you're ready to go. You go inside of your company's <coughs> website and you create a new composer.json file. You, I'm using Vim, uh, I'm using a slideshow, um, but you can use Vim, you can use Sublime Edit, whatever. You're just making a, a, a JSON file. The minimum amount of information you need is just a, a short JSON structure. You have a require key. Uh, and then some, uh, some dependencies inside of that object. So you have a package name. I'm using Guzzle. The first one's usually the vendor. The second one's the package name. Um, if Sometimes people just have one package, so it's Guzzle, Guzzle, or Monolog, Monolog. Their vendor and package name are the same. And then you declare your version number, OK? Uh, you, that you need for, for the project. We'll talk a little bit more about those version numbers. If you don't always remember how to create um, this composer.json file, you can also, and you're not going to be able to see this slide, I tested it out and you won't be able to see this, I'll read it to you. Um, you can run a composer.init in your project directory and that will run a, a little interactive question and answer session and it will use those uh, questions, it will use those answers that you give to those questions to build, to build your composer file for you. So for example, it, it's asking you, what do you want to name your package? So you can give it your vendor name slash whatever. So I did scan slash company website as my package name. It'll ask you for a description, that's optional. You don't need to give it a description, but if you do give it a description and you decide to publish your library, that's what people are gonna see when they search for your library. So that description just tells people what this library is for, what it does. Uh, it'll ask for an author name. You can supply an author, your email address, your Twitter username or whatever. I'll ask what your license is. You can specify a license or not specify a license. Then I'll ask you for your dependencies. You type in a package name and it will search uh, the, the package uh, repo called Packagist and say, hey, here's the different ones that match your name. Which one did you mean? You type in zero or whatever. Then it'll say, what version do you want to use for this package, etc. You go through all of that and it spits out your final uh, composer.json. The only thing that's required in the JSON file is this require stuff, all this other stuff is fluff and you don't really need, okay? Unless you're publishing your package, then you probably want to add some more stuff to it because it's helpful to know licenses and who to contact and what it does. Questions so far? So if you've got two web apps running on a server, uh -huh. do you run Composer uh, twice, once for each of the yes. two projects? So it is, if those full, if those, if it has its own repository, it has its own composer stuff. That's <coughs> likely. So if, if you're cloning one into folder A and one into folder B, you would go inside of each, you'd go into folder A and create a composer.json, you'd go into folder B and create composer.json, declare their dependencies separate from each other. Uh, they might use the same libraries, they might use different libraries, they might be using different versions, doesn't matter because those dependencies are installed locally to that project. The dependencies will be installed into folder A, dependencies will be installed into folder B. And if they're using the same libraries, you might have some duplication there. Um, and if you want, you could try symlinking those to get rid of those uh, 
similar files. I find it easier to just hard disk space is cheap. Just use it. Uh, and then if you have different versions, it's not going to cause conflicts. And you might be getting this. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be interested to know how you put Composer into the file structure of each of those web apps. So I usually install Co Composer globally, so it's used everywhere. Okay. Uh, I don't install it on a per project basis. I just install it globally to the system. So I'll put it on my development box globally, and then I'll put it on my production boxes globally. And uh, when I deploy, I'll, I'll have Composer install those dependencies for me. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? So there's lots of different ways to declare the versions that you want to use. The simplest way is just to be very specific. Uh, so I want to use Guzzle 3.4.3, and that's the version you're always going to get every single time. Uh, not the most helpful one. You're going to be, if you hard code it to a very specific version, you're going to be updating your composer.json file a lot to switch to different versions that are released. And sometimes that's good if, if the versions aren't following semantic versioning. Maybe it's helpful to lock down to a very specific version so you're not uh, so your app doesn't break when, when you update to new versions, if those new versions aren't backwards compatible. It, anyone, who, who's familiar with semantic versioning? No one? A few people? So semantic versioning, uh, very helpful concept. Uh, let's go back to this last little slide real quick. So we have 343, three. Uh, let's call this one X, Y, and Z. So in semantic versioning, um, if you're just doing a small internal bug fix or whatnot, you would increase the patch level Z. So if you fix the bug, backwards compa compatibility doesn't change or anything, you just bump this up to 4. So you'd be at version 3.4.4. Uh, you would change the minor, vi the, the minor version number if you're adding new features to the public API. Backwards compatibility is still not broken. You just added new information to the, to the uh, API. It might be a new function or or some bigger bug fixes or whatnot. Uh, when you change the public API, but it's still backwards compatible, you'd bump that up to five. So you'd be at 3.5, and then you reset the patch back to zero, so 3.5.0. When you do introduce backwards compatibility changes, then you bump up the major uh, version number, and that becomes four. And that means anything that used to work with three probably is not gonna work with four, it's not backwards compatible, you're probably gonna have to do a rewrite, okay? You have this option of specifying your version numbers, 3.4.star, and that will take any patch level. So it could be 3.4.0, 3.4.4, 3.4.10, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, you, as long as you're on a 3.4, Composer will take the latest version that it can find inside of 3.4. You can specify your versions with greater than, equals, um, and and, so this is saying greater than or equal to 3.4, and it's less than version 4. Okay. Sorry if I just missed this, but I sort of, is there a separate versioning, or are these going to be the version numbers that these project maintainers have? So these are version numbers that the project maintainers have. So Guzzle decides what their version number is, and you decide which version to use. Other questions? You can make these more complex. Um, the type being an OR statement, so we're saying we want 3, 4, or 3, 6, anything that's in between that, 3, 4, or 3, 6, or if 4.0 or greater has been released, use 4.0 instead. You're probably not going to use that very often, but that's an option. Then there's the one I like. This is most useful with semantic versioning. Fill it out 3.4. Uh, that's the same as saying greater than or equal to 3.4, but less than 4. So it's going to let you do 3, 5, 3, 6, 3, 7 until you get up to 4. So it's just like the, just like this one, means the exact same thing as this one, but this one's easier to type. Questions how that works? You can do the same thing with the patch level. Uh, you want 3.4.2, but not 3.4.1, but you'll take 3.3, .3, 0.5, 0.6, 0.10. So this is similar to 3.4.star, except we're excluding 0.1, okay? Again, you could also write that as a greater than or less than, but that's just probably easier. If you want to live life on the edge, you can specify stability flags. So here we're taking the development branch. 
Uh, you can take, you can do at dev, at, at beta, at alpha, or at RC. And as long as the library you're using is marking dev, beta, alpha, or RC versions, that will download the appropriate version. Okay. You can go directly to a branch. So if you have a branch called master, probably do, then you would do dev hyphen master. If you had a branch called feature, then you do dev hyphen feature. And it's gonna go to the head of that branch. <coughs> or you can do something awful and, and specify a specific commit that you want in that branch. Uh, so if you don't want head, you want whatever commit for whatever reason, you can do that, but you really shouldn't be doing this. If you're doing this, it should be very, very temporary because uh, you're going to be locked on that commit in, in, in version and you're going to have to go and find out the new one or whatever and upload it. Much better to stay on a version. You're, you know what you're using. You know what's there. This is very uncommon. Questions about any of the different types of versioning formats? Okay, so you have your, you your composer.json file, you've declared all your dependencies, uh, now you're ready to download those dependencies. You're gonna type in composer update on your command line, and then composer's gonna do its magic. So it's gonna look through your composer.json file, and we said we needed guzzle and monolog, and it said, oh, monolog needs PSR log, so it downloads the version of PSR log that monolog needs. And it downloads monolog, and then I run out of room, and it downloads guzzle and some symphony libraries. At the end of that, you can see it's doing two very important things. It's writing a lock file, and it's generating an autoloader. That autoloader so you can use the files in your library easily. The lock file uh, controls what versions you downloaded. Um, so you're then going to commit that file along with your composer.json file, and that's going to make sure all your other developers that clone down that repo use the exact same version of those libraries that I did. So if I've locked down to Guzzle 3.4.2, that's in my composer.lock file, and then Guzzle updates to 3.5, and even though that might match what I wrote in the composer.json, my other developers, as long as they run composer correctly, it's going to get the, the version inside of that lock file. It's still going to download the composer or the guzzle 3.4 or whatever I said. It's not going to go to the guzzle 3.5 because you specified in your lock file what that exact version is using. That's very helpful to make sure that everyone's on the same page and one person's not doing a slightly different version of guzzle that might work one way and another person's using guzzle that might expect it a slightly different way. You, you're all locked down to the same version, even though your composer.json file might allow for more advanced versions. <coughs> so what you want to do when you're getting ready to commit this, add your composer.json, add your composer.lock file, but ignore everything in the vendor file. That's where composer installs everything. You don't want to commit all of those third-party libraries for the reasons we talked about earlier. So ignore that whole vendor folder, okay? Then you push that up. A new developer comes along, they clone down the repository, they run Composer install. Notice they're doing Composer install, not Composer update. Composer install reads the lock file and downloads everything that they need. Gets all the exact same versions, whatever. If they do a Composer.update, that's going to update the lock file. So you always run Composer install to read from the lock file. You do Composer update to update the lock file to new versions. Okay. Good question. Someone at work was telling me that Composer install will not overwrite files already in the vendor's folder. So if they checked out a new Git version that had an updated lock mm -hmm. file, but they had already filled out their vendor with existing versions, they were saying that running Composer install didn't. So Composer install, the as long as, you might have an out of date Composer. Oh, okay. I would run Composer self update to, to get that updated, but it should install everything correctly. And I'll, I'll show an example of that later, but. Okay, so Composer <coughs> But if you have, if you you have on the lock 1.5 in there and you run Composer install and Composer in your lock file says, hey, you're supposed to do Composer 1.7, it's gonna delete monolog 1.5 and replace it with Composer 1.7. Oh, it even Composer will make sure you're on the right versions. It will force okay. you to use the correct dependencies, which is the great thing about it. Good question, other questions? You said it created a, a um, auto loader, uh -huh. is that a file? Yeah, we'll talk about the auto loader in a bit. Other questions? 
Um, one thing, one thing that you might have seen is when you run a composer, uh, installer composer update, and you've you've gone in and modified files inside of the vendor directly, even though you're not supposed to. Oh. Say you've gone into the Symphony and you've you've put a bug fix in there and modified that source code directly. When you run composer installer composer update, it's going to say, "Hey, you've changed these files. What do you want me to do? Do you want to override them? Do you want to keep your changes? Do you want to abort?" Uh, so Composer will know if you've modified the files that you're not supposed to and complain to you. So that, it might have been that as well. Okay. Don't, don't go in and modify your vendor files. If you want to fork the library, go and fork it. Don't, don't hack it and just change the files on your own. Okay? Okay. Composer also allows, allows you to, to declare dependencies that are just needed for development. You don't need PHP unit on your production boxes, hopefully. Some people probably have a use case for that, but most people don't need PHP unit on their production boxes. So instead of declaring it as a production requirement, you just declare it as a dev requirement. These dev requirements look just the same as the normal requirements, except dev requirements are only installed when you ask for them. To ask for your dev requirements to be installed, you do composer install hyphen hyphen dev. Without that hyphen hyphen dev, composer install will ignore your dev dependencies. With the hyphen hyphen install, you can see we get PHP unit, whatever, 3.7.28. Okay? Composer update works a little bit differently. <laughs> composer update assumes you're working on your development machine. You're probably not logging into production to update your dependencies on the fly, because you probably want to test them out before you push to production. So, Composer update defaults to always installing your dev dependencies if you want to, your, your dependencies. If you don't want to install dev dependencies on composer update, you do composer update hyphen hyphen no hyphen dev. And that will ignore your dev dependencies when you update. Okay? But composer install hyphen hyphen dev will get you your, your dev um, dependencies. Question? So if you're deploying, you want to always use install, not uh, when you're installing to production, you should all. When you're deploying to production, you should always use Composer install. You you'd have to be crazy to use Composer update okay, on, on production because you could get a new version that you've not even tested. So always use update com updates the version too. Yeah, yeah, Composer update updates the version. Uh, so always use Composer install on production uh, to make sure you're using the versions you've already checked and the versions that are written in your lock file. Other questions. Yeah, you can, you can put more things in your require than just packages. Um, these are optional things to put in, in here. They're going to be enforced by Composer, but Composer's not going to do anything about it. So if you say, hey, I need PHP at least 5.4, it will check to see if you have PHP 5.4. And if you have PHP 5.3, it will say, hey, you can't use this library. But it's not going to then go and download PHP 5.4 and set it up for you, OK? All it's going to do is say, hey, you can't do this and quit out. You can ask for certain extensions. So if you need the extension, I, the extension Intel, you can request it, and Composer will check for it, but it's not going to install it for you. Okay? With, with ex and, and you can do the same thing with libraries. If you need curl on the box, you can, hey, I need curl. Again, it's not going to install curl for you. With extensions and libraries, uh, the versioning's awful. So the Composer. Uh, documentation says just use star for the version, and you'll you'll get the version. <laughs> you'll get it, but they don't do versioning very well. Is the summary there? Okay, so you can you can request any version of PHP. You can do extensions. They always start with ext hyphen then the extension name. You can do several different libraries like memcache, curl, some other stuff that's listed on the website. And those always are prefixed with lib. Again, Composer's not installing them for you, just enforcing those dependencies. Uh, this is how to update your lock file. You just run Composer Update. It's going to find, they found a new version of Guzzle, so it removes Guzzle 3.8, installs Guzzle 3.81, updates the lock file. You commit your changes, commit the Composer JSON, commit the Composer lock, and push that all up. Your other developers are going to clone everything down. They run Composer install, it removes 3.8.0, and it's going to install 3.8.1, even if 3.8.2 has been released since then. Install always reads from the lock file, doesn't care if there's new versions, installs exactly what's specified in the lock file. Okay?
let's say let's say Guzzle 4.0 comes out. You want to upgrade to Guzzle 4.0, so you run Composer update. It says there's nothing to install or update. What happened? Your well, someone said something. Your versioning. Yeah, my versioning. So looking at the Composer JSON, I said, hey, I just want 3.8 only. 3.8, 3.9, 3.999, but not 4. So you have to actually, when there's a new version and your Composer file is not letting you do it, you're going to have to update your Composer JSON to allow for that new version. Then you can run Composer update. Then it will remove 3.8. Then it'll put 4 on. You write your lock file, commit that, push it up. Okay. So if there's a new version you're trying to use and it's not installing for whatever reason, check your composer.json to make sure your version constraints are allowing for that version. When you're updating your composer.json file, it's easy to make mistakes. And if you're not careful, you might just commit it up and someone else is going to use it and say, hey, this isn't working. Anyone see the error here? Missing a comma. I'm missing a comma. You can run it through a JSON lint. You can try to debug it yourself. Or you can type composer validate. And composer validate will lint it for you and say, hey, I'm expecting something here. You probably missed a comma. So you can run composer validate to make sure your composer.json file is following the schema of the composer.json requirements. Okay? Let's talk about using that autoloader. So Composer creates an autoloader for you. The autoloader is located in your vendor directory, autoload.php. To use it, you just need to require it in. And then I'm using some fancy library with namespaces, so I have to declare I'm using that namespace. But once you have your namespaces declared of the, the classes you want to use, uh, once you've bring in, bring in that Composer autoloader, you can just go ahead and use it. So new client. Going board game geek, grabbing board game, requesting it from the API, and echoing out the body. That's all you have to do. Just to include that vendor auto load, and you're using all your composer libraries. Nothing more difficult than that. The auto loader that comes with composer supports PSR0, PSR4, class maps, and file includes. Who's familiar with PSR0? PSR4. Okay, so let's talk about PSR0 and PSR4. Uh, PSR0 and PSR4 are very similar. PSR0, um, you, can, you can look these up in the, uh, if you Google PSR0, PSR4, something will pop up. Uh, but PSR0, you've, you've probably seen if you used the Zen framework or if you worked with pair packages. Uh, they're usually going to be like guzzle underscore HTTP underscore client, or they'll look like a namespace, guzzle slash HTTP slash client, okay? What PSR0 does is it converts that into a directory structure. So if it sees guzzle underscore HTTP underscore client, it's going to look for a folder, guzzle, then look for a folder, HTTP, then look for a file called client.php. Okay? So that's how PSR0 works. It just replaces those underscores or slashes with, and turns it into a directory structure, depends on .php and looks for the file there. Okay? PSR4, very similar, except you can say, hey, when you see Guzzle, instead of looking for a folder called Guzzle, look for a folder called lib slash Guzzle slash source. That would be a terrible directory, but you can say that. And then it will consume Guzzle, and then inside of, what do they say? Lib source Guzzle. Inside of there, it will look for an HTTP folder, and then, and then look for a client.php. So the only difference between PSR0, PSR4, PSR4 doesn't do anything with underscores. It just treats them as underscores. It doesn't convert them. And PSR4 will consume your, your namespace prefix and turn it into a folder. And then depend on the rest of the stuff that is not consumed. Okay. Uh, feel free to Google those if you want more information, or you can talk to me after if, if I've confused you there. Uh, file includes, that's just like doing an include once. Nothing difficult there. Class maps are basically an array. The class map key is your file name, so or your, your class name. So Guzzle HTTP client would be the key in the array, and then the value of that key would be the, the file that contains that class. <coughs> okay? Class maps, from my understanding, are, are the fastest way to autoload something. It doesn't have to parse the class name, it doesn't have to create a directory structure and then check if that's there. 
class maps, you just find the name in the array, you get the file, and you load up that file. So class maps are the fastest way to do it. But most people are going to be using PSR0 or PSR4. So what, what Composer lets you do is convert those PSR0s and those PSR4s into class maps. So if you run class, or if you run composer dump auto load hyphen O, or you can do this when you're installing, you can do composer install hyphen O or composer, composer update hyphen O. That O stands for optimize. It's going to comb through all of your classes uh, using PSR0 and PSR4, and then it's going to spit them out into a class map and, and cache that file inside of your vendor directory. And then all the, all the loading after that is going to use that class map and be a lot faster. So here's an example. It found guzzle HTTP client, and that's inside of the vendor directory, and guzzle, guzzle, source, guzzle, HTTP client. Awesome name. Okay? Questions about auto loading? Is it, um, so every time you do an update, it'll add that auto load.php since you're ignoring the, the vendor folder? Mm -hmm. So it does have to generate your, it does have to generate the auto load files for you. And, and again, you don't want to add that because when a new library updates, the directory structure might change. You always want to be re recreating that, that auto load. And that, that, that just takes a few milliseconds. Unless you have tons of things, then it takes a few more milliseconds. <laughs> but the composer doesn't like remember you're doing it this way and automatically do that. For no, you have to put the, the hyphen O flag every time. Okay. So well, hopefully you're, you have some kind of deploy script that you're using. You're not doing it manually. If you're doing it manually, just remember, but you can set your deploy script up to, to use that hyphen O. If you're doing it manually, you'll probably get tired of it one day and then you can write a deploy script. <laughs> okay, where can you find all these packages? Figure out what's out there and, and put your own packages up. Um, there's a website called Packages. Uh, you can go to that website and search for things that you want. On your composer.json files, you can specify keywords. That keywords are going to be used in the search. It will also match on the name and the description. It will it'll try to do a good job. So you can go there. Let's say you need some kind of, I don't know, what do you need? Some kind of REST client to talk to a certain API. Come, come to Packages, search for the, maybe you want to talk to Coinbase's API. Come to Packages, search for Coinbase, find, find if they have a Packages, or they have a Composer package. Um, it will show you the version information, what versions are out there, what their package name is. So it's probably coin, it's probably Coinbase type in Coinbase. Put that in your required JSON or in Composer update, and you can download that new package. You can also go to Packages uh, to upload your own packages. So you hit submit package, um, you tell it where that repository is located, and then it will index it and put it up on packages for everybody else to use. Okay. Let's say there's a package that you want to use, but it's not on packages. Then what do you do? By default, Composer is always looking on packages. So if it's not on packages, it's not going to find it by default. But you might have a private library that you don't want to share with the world. I have a topsecret.git repo. I don't want to put that up on packages. That has all my company secrets, all of our whatever. We don't want to put that up as public. Inside of your composer.json file, you can define where to look besides just on packages. Uh, so here, I'm specifying a repository. The type is VCS version control. And then here's where my repo is located. So you just put that at the top of your composer.json. And then inside of your require, you can now use scan top secret. Okay? So if it's not on packages, no big deal. Add a repository. Add a repository object or a repository array in your composer.json and go ahead and use it. Now this will only work if <coughs> this also has a composer.json file inside of it. If that doesn't have a composer.json in, inside of it, submit a pull request and try to get one in. That's going to be your easiest way. If they're not going to accept your pull request, um, I'm going to skip the slide real quick. You probably can't read this too well. Uh, but you can see, you can still use it. If they're not going to merge in your composer.json because they're mini pants, no big deal. Uh, you create a new repository, give a type of package, and then you define the package. And there's a lot of information needed here, but it is what it is. You name the package, you specify the version of the package. If they're not using versioning tags themselves, you might have to specify what version this is. You give it a, 
where it can download a zip file or an archive of all that code, and then you specify how that auto-loading works for that library. Probably some trial and error to get this all right. You probably have to go back and look at the composer documentation to see everything. But once you've got that in there, you can now use that. So this is a package I try to use. I've submitted so many composer.json pull requests to her, and she just ignores them all. But I still need to use it. So I put all that in there, and then I can use this Selenium web driver and have it installed and managed by composer uh, as part of my dependencies. Okay. So even if they don't have a composer.json file, try to get one merged in. If not, no big deal. You can use it. Going back, uh, repository, um, and if you might have pair packages you like to use. Pair used to be a huge deal, and people would install pair. PHP unit used to be through pair, whatever. There might be some pair stuff that you need to use. Uh, you can have Composer manage all your pair stuff. Again, you just add a repository, type pair, and point to that pair channel. Your package names then become a little bit, a little bit weird. Composer requires you to, to do a pair hyphen appended onto it. And then you either do the channel alias or the full channel name, and then the pair package name. Again, <coughs> versioning, might, you might just have to do a star. You might have a version you could use. Who knows? Okay? I don't work a lot with pair. I haven't done a lot of composer pair stuff, but it's an option for those of you that do. Okay? Does that auto load? Or yes, and then it's going to install them locally to your vendor directory. It's going to put them inside of the vendor auto loader, and you're going to use it just like any other library that composer installs. Other questions? What if you use, um, we use some um, Zen, um, we don't use the whole framework, we mm -hmm. use some of the... So Zen, I believe they've moved all their stuff to Composer, so you should be able to find Zen packages. Uh, Zen's very good about that. I don't know if, uh, I know Zen 2 is, I don't know about Zen 1, I don't know uh, if Zen 1's been converted to Composer, but Zen Framework 2 has, and they're, you can pull in their different packages. Symphony does it very well. A lot, of the, a lot of the frameworks these days are all moving to Composer, it's very nice. Was there another question back here? Yeah, so um, I don't know if this was asked, but on your private example, uh, uh -huh. will it use the tag branches to get the Yes, it will. Okay. So. And, okay, cool. Um, and then our production boxes don't have access to the internet. Okay. So is it possible to completely mirror packages um, uh, so that you have your own internal copy? You can create a private packages server <coughs> Um, there's a whole bunch of tutorials out there. I haven't ever done it before, but theoretically it's possible. Okay. Other questions? If, if not, you could have some kind of staging server that R syncs it out. I don't know. Yeah, that's what we do with things like um, CRAN repository from R. Uh -huh. uh, is is uh, in stage, we'll make sure that um, mirrored and backed up the, the, everything that we use from a uh, public repo. Right. Just so that we can repeat it. Right. I, I haven't tried it before, but supposedly it's possible to look for a private packages server when you Google it. Okay, like I said, share your libraries. Everyone is running such awesome, good stuff. Um, you're, you've probably written something that somebody else can use. My, my default mode used to be, hey, go write my own library to do something that I need to do. Now my default mode is go search packages because somebody else has done it, I promise you. Go check it out, use theirs. If theirs sucks, make it better. Put your own up, let somebody else use your better library. Um, it's very easy to publish things in packages. It's very nice to have a whole bunch of different packages to use. Spread the love, share your, share your packages, let other people use them. I just said five minutes. Oh, okay, five minutes. Okay, things I did not tell you about Composer. Uh, in your packages, you can, you can suggest other packages to use. So for example, when you, when you clone down Monolog, it will say, hey, you might want to use uh, Monolog HipChat, or you, wanna, you might want to use Monolog something else. And these are other packages that you can use to give you, to give you more functions, functionality, but you don't have to use. So you can suggest other packages that might work well with your package. You can replace other people's packages. So say like you forked the Zen framework, and you have some custom stuff in there, but you have other dependencies that need the Zen framework. You don't want to get your fork installed in, in, the, in the Zen framework installed. You can just say, hey, my fork replaces the Zen framework. Anything that needs the Zen framework, use my fork instead, okay? 
So even though you forked it and you're using all these third-party libraries that want the non-forked version of Zend, you can say, hey, just use my version of Zend instead. You can conflict. If you're using the Zend framework and you don't want someone to install the Symfony framework, you can say, hey, the Zend framework conflicts with the Symfony framework. Don't let them install both packages at once. Composer can run scripts before and after the Composer command runs or before and after uh, a package is installed. Um, I know Symfony uses this. Uh, when, when you download new packages with Symfony, it will run a script afterwards to compile all the assets, to clear the cache, to make sure everything's in the right place for Symfony, because Symfony needs to do a few extra things because you're usually installing Symfony bundles and they need to know about those bundles and register them, install assets, whatever. So you can have scripts run before and after you run a composer just by putting some lines in your composer.json. <coughs> uh, if you want to tweak things about how composer works, you can tweak a global config file. This will let you specify things like a GitHub OAuth key if you're hitting your rate limit. Uh, maybe you don't want to install into the vendor directory, you can specify a different place to install. Maybe you always want to ignore the composer cache and always download the newest version, even if it's you have a cached version on your computer, ignore the composer cache and go download the version. Um, you can use composer as to install things globally if you really want to. If you have PHP unit and you don't want to install it inside of every single package or every single project, you can use a composer install global to install that package across your entire operating system. I haven't ever done that, but it's an option. There's a whole bunch of command lines and stuff that I didn't talk about, like you can do a composer required. Instead of modifying your composer.json file directly, you can run composer require to search for packages and have it modify your composer.json automatically. Um, and other crazy stuff that I'm not talking about, but you can look it up. Uh, you can host your own private packages server. I talked about that. Any questions? 